growing up uh, as a young boy in New Jersey, I lived in a house with a really big backyard. And my neighborhood friends and I spent all our time in that backyard all summer long, except when we, the 20 or so times every day that we came into my house. <laughs> At which point, I would hear those inevitable words by my mom, are you coming in or are you going out? Shut the door. <laughs> I know that's never happened to any of you. And I learned for the first time this idea that a door isn't just a protection from the bad people, but it's kind of an airlock to the outdoor climate. At the end of every summer, my family traveled to upstate New York, and we stayed in an Adirondack lodge with a big oversized porch and the occasional brief but intense rainstorm. It didn't matter when that happened, people stayed on the porch, they visited, they played games, they talked, and they enjoyed themselves comfortable as they listened to the rain come down on their roof, cascade on the sidewalk. And I learned that there was this idea that it was actually okay, it could be pretty exhilarating to be close to intense weather, as long as you weren't actually in it. My third weather memory comes from a particularly harsh winter in the Northeast when my family escaped to the Caribbean. And we stayed in a small house that centered around an open courtyard. No doors, no windows, no screen. Separated my place on the pullout couch from the sounds of the wind blowing through the palms or the smell of the flowers or the multi-legged creatures I could imagine were crawling toward me every night as I tried to sleep. And I learned that we don't only stay and live indoors because we want to be comfortable, but also because we want to be safe. Now, I want to be an architect for as long as I can remember. And for almost as long, I've been fascinated by this idea of the connection between the indoors and outdoors of my buildings. It's interesting to note that Americans spend about 90% of their time indoors. And when they, want to be, when they are indoors, they want to be comfortable. These days, with the technology of heating and cooling, that's as easy as the twist of a thermostat. But we love being outdoors. It doesn't take a scientific study to tell us that when we're outdoors, we strive for a home for review. We walk in the park in the weekends and after work. We hunger to vacation in exotic outdoor locales. And when we're indoors, we surround ourselves with air fresheners, air purifying machines, unscented candles, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and even plants with the idea that if we have to be stuck indoors, and that's an interesting term because I don't ever remember anyone saying they're stuck outdoors. Um, we're comfortable, we're close to nature. But what if we could work outdoors? What if we could change that whole idea of having to be inside? Well, we already do it. In today's mobile, wireless, controlled world, every day we're bombarded with technology. Its only purpose is to untether us from the reason, the need to be in any particular place. Coffee shops, airports, even the sideline watching your child play soccer, those are our new mobile work zone. So I thought maybe buildings need to take better advantage of this new reality. The problem is weather gets in our way. That's why about a million years ago, we moved into caves. Humans started thinking about that. If you take a look at the definition for a building, it says permanent walls, <coughs> roofs, structure. Those don't engender this idea of a warm and fuzzy connection between the indoors and the outdoors. So, as architects, we look at this idea of a cave, and really, a, ca a building is just a cave with temperature control. And so about 15 years ago, I thought, is there a way we can actually make the outdoors more comfortable to get people to be out in it? We call this a climate comfort boost, and it's not a machine, it's actually an idea. Our first opportunity to do this came in the mid-90s when we came up with this idea for a local park where we put tall misting fans 
in the air to blow cooling air on people as they enjoyed this very popular outdoor music event when it was where the temperatures were normally over 100 degrees. We moved on to buildings and we had our first opportunity to try this on a maintenance facility, interestingly enough, where we not only had a building that opened to the outdoors and had very little heating and cooling, but we created a sunshade which allowed us to basically deflect the hot western sun from the face of the building. Moving on to an outdoor amphitheater, if anyone here has ever been in a tented wedding in a summer, they know cross ventilation is something that's sadly lacking. Well, we had this idea to create a series of louvers which would let the breezes go through. And one of the unintended, maybe, benefits of this was the idea that it was a minimal impact on the landscape. We went one step further with our project for a outdoor restaurant where we created the minimum number of walls that were necessary for privacy. Everything else was open. But our real breakthrough came at an elementary school that we just finished and is open for just a few months, where the dreaded all-purpose cafetorium has morphed into exercise space and small cafes and a theater that are all located outdoors. The idea is that music classrooms have deep overhangs and open to into stages when the weather permits. Now the question I, probably the most frequent question I get asked by parents is, it's a nice theater, but couldn't you just finish putting the cover over the top? It would have been really nice. And my answer, uh, and not facetiously, is we wanted to create a hole to the sky, a place where every day children would be walking through a space and experiencing nature's expressions, good and bad. And we went one step further, which was outdoor hallways, which were very common in Northern California, became outdoor learning galleries by taking big fans and pumping air through a ductwork which bleeds into the space with cooling air. The result, 80 degrees when it's 100 degrees outside. And in the wintertime, radiant heating that would create a warming spot only when the children were occupying that space. The significance of this is it actually gave us a place all year round where kids could do more than just walk from classroom to classroom. This is our building, 77,000 square feet. This is how much of it is outdoors, 39,000 square feet. 50% 50 of our learning space is located outdoors. The government says this is actually important because we use a lot less energy. And buildings in the United States take 70% of the electricity used in our country. 70%. So if we could take all of our buildings and use less electricity, maybe we could all be saying, do we really need more power plants? And it's not just about energy. Uh, a indoor air quality is very important in today's buildings. It's a big issue. Well, if you're outside, fresh air is not a problem. And in fact, how many sick days would be avoided in our work <laughs> environment if we weren't constantly breathing someone else's air? So, does this work everywhere? Does this work if you're in Texas or Florida or New York? I decided to do a little research. But I couldn't find what I was looking for. I'm not a climatologist, I'm just an architect. But I decided in our office we would create some climate comfort maps. And the key to this is that we would map people against where they live. So we started with temperature. And the idea in temperature is that we started with what's a comfort line, what, where all the temperatures are pretty moderate below that line. And then we mapped people who live in coastal communities in the United States. And we found that 52% of America lives near the coast but not all of them live in a climate zone. And temperature alone isn't a good comfort indicator anyway. We need more. So we looked at humidity, we looked at wind, we looked at temperature and rainfall, and we created and divided our country into three zones. Extreme, so noted because when it's winter, sometimes it can get pretty ugly out there when you're going outside. And favorable, when you never really have to think about what you're wearing. Everything else is the marginal zone, which is where we live. 
we found that if we just concentrated on the marginal zone, we could positively affect one in eight Americans with this idea of a climate comfort boost. That's 40 million people. And if we went one step further, we could actually treat this as a model for the world because interestingly enough, the United States represents almost all the climate zones of the world. Well, this is my Zen workspace. <laughs> and uh, it's only here in my mind, I'm sorry to say. But I know, I am convinced that I would love working in this space after all I created it. And I know it would use less energy. So is this idea of a climate comfort boost universal to all buildings? No, it's not. But if you think about it for a second, outdoor grocery stores, they exist in most of the world. They're called open air markets. And the French are perfectly OK with the idea of outdoor bathrooms. Maybe we could learn something, by the way, from other cultures. Do the same tools work everywhere as they would work in Northern California? No, you need different things to do, and we're already working on that in our office to come up with more tools for our toolkit. And in the end, maybe the idea behind this is that that door, which has always been a barrier, becomes more of a doorway. Because if we can create a zone in between just being outdoors or indoors, we can be using less energy, which is a good thing, we can be more comfortable and healthier in our body, and maybe also a little bit in our mind. A few years ago, I stumbled on this, what I consider brilliant piece of instinctive building design on a beach in Northern California. It's not a traditional building in any sense. It uses materials that are at hand, literally. It's got walls as a windbreak, but no roof, as per the typical definition, to let the warm summer sun come in. And I thought this person gets it. And maybe there's something that they can teach us here. And that is that at the end of the day, as well as all those other things I've talked about, if we actually start to align our buildings to the planet's climate instead of the other way around, which we've been doing traditionally, then maybe in the end, we'll have more of a stake in its ultimate health. Thank you.